You asked for it, you got it. My top 10 technology trends for 2021. This is Blue Collar Coder, and I'm Jack Harrington. So great to have you here. I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than some other YouTubers may do it, where I'm actually going to gear my top 10 towards the skills and technology that are gonna make you a better engineer in 2021 and going on to 2022. So it might not be all of the latest and greatest, but this is the stuff that I would focus on. And if you find that you're weak in any of these areas, they're definitely gonna be worth some of your time. It's only 10 of them and there's 12 months in a year. Even if you spent a whole month on each one, you'd still be ahead of the game. First up is TypeScript. TypeScript is really important. I think jobs in 2021 are going to say, TypeScript is a nice to have, and in 2022 are gonna be saying that TypeScript is a must have. So this year is a year where me personally, I'm gonna make sure that every video that I've got coming out is more than likely gonna be TypeScript. I'm doing mostly TypeScript. There's a bunch of reasons for this. The war of TypeScript versus Flow versus not using types, I think has pretty much been solved for larger open source projects and more popular open source projects. TypeScript has definitely become the language of choice. So this is one where it's really, really critical at this point that if you are a JavaScript programmer and that is your day job, learn TypeScript. And the easiest way to do that is to go and take an existing project that you have that you're familiar with in JavaScript, maybe a you know, proof of concept that you created, something like that, and then just port that to TypeScript. And the reason that you wanna start on a project that you already have is because you kinda of understand that JavaScript and there's not a lot of mystery there. You don't wanna be struggling with both getting your application to work and also getting the types to work at the same time. If you can just do focus on one of those things, the typing, that's gonna help you and make it a lot easier to learn. And that's kind of the crux of the converting to TypeScript series that I've done on this channel and I've linked to in the description. TypeScript, 2021. Let's make this thing happen. Micro state managers. So what is that? Well, so we've had React hooks starting two years ago and we started converting all of our state from Redux or MobX into doing it in the components and using maybe use state and use context directly. And that's fine in some circumstances, but in other circumstances that use context extension essentially falls over as your component trees get larger and larger and larger and changing the value in use context requires a rebuild of that entire tree from there down, which ends up having efficiency problems. So you still maybe need one of these new micro state managers. And in that category, I would call things like Valshio, Zustan, or Zustant if you prefer, Jotai, Recoil, I've covered a bunch on this channel. Go check out those videos, try it out. They're actually really simple to use. And those that's one of the ones that you can actually just try in a day, get something under your belt, put it on your resume, and you'll be the person that when you run into one of these scenarios where you kind of need a little bit of state that's managed globally, you'll be there and you'll be able to say, hey, I have some solutions for you. The next one I think you should spend some time on in this coming year is GraphQL. So GraphQL has had a great year and there's a really solid reason for that. And that's because it's a standard. I know we've been having the whole GraphQL versus REST fight for the last couple of years, but there's really not a fight there. Honestly, REST is just an architectural style. And because it's kind of weak and ill-defined, you can't actually layer anything on top of it reliably. You can with GraphQL. GraphQL is a standard, and that means that you can write servers to that standard, you can write clients to that standard, and because of that, there's a booming ecosystem of stuff happening in the GraphQL space, and that's great. So what I've seen over the past year, for example, like Hasura has come out, and that's a service that you can connect to a relational database management system, and it puts a GraphQL interface on it with just a click of a few buttons. That's super exciting. On the Node GraphQL server side, just had some experience with Nexus Schema, which is a different way of defining a GraphQL schema. It's much more reliable, and it outputs TypeScript 
types as part of the build process, which is great because then you can consume those on the client side and it makes it really, really easy. And then on the client side, there's a new code generator for GraphQL that just came out. So lots of great stuff because of that GraphQL ecosystem. If you wanna get started with it, there's actually some publicly available GraphQL servers out there. You just connect to their GraphQL UI, start making some requests, and then you can get a sense of how it is to create a query on a GraphQL server. And then you can go take that query, bring it into a Create React app and use maybe Apollo Client or Urkel and go connect to it. And you can say legitimately at that point, hey, I've had some experience with GraphQL. I understand it. I understand what queries are. It's good stuff. Easy to get into. Give it a try. Utility first CSS, or honestly, let's face it, just Tailwind. It's a different approach to making a CSS framework where we've been used to something like a bootstrap where you basically define up front, hey, this is what a button's gonna look like. Utility first CSS frameworks allow you to kind of construct a button from a bunch of classes or any kind of field or whatever you have. You construct them up from these classes and it's just a really nice way if you, if you understand CSS, it's a great way to build out a component library or, or an interface or what have you. So one way I'd learn this is to follow along with the video that I just did on using Twin Macro and Create React App. That's a great starter point. If you wanna stay in React land in a component library, I would look at Chakra UI. That's a really nice component library that kind of follows that Tailwind model. ECMAScript modules. This is something that you're gonna to wanna to know about in 2021, 2022, because it's yet another way of packaging JavaScript, but it's also more native. It's native to browsers, it's native to Deno. Uh, you can use it for things like Vite to set up a view project really easily. So try out one of those. There is a video on this channel that you can check out. But again, there's all these really cool things like Vite, which are really cool ways of setting up a project and running it really quickly. Micro front ends. This is a personal favorite of mine, of course. It's a big deal this year and next year and going on forward because of our move towards a microsite architecture. So microsites are where you take a monolithic app and then you break it into separate applications that are each essentially bound together by routing. And the problem there is that sharing becomes an issue. And that's why micro FEs have become so important over the last year, classic examples of micro FEs that everybody needs would be a header or an, and a footer. Another use case would be a shared carousel because you don't want to redo that code in a bunch of different places. And the advantage of a micro FE sharing system as opposed to an NPM sharing system is that you get live updating. And the easiest way to implement all of that is via module federation. So, my advice to you is to check out the Mike simplified video, go through that example, try it out. If it doesn't work for you, leave a comment and I'll address it in the comments, or you can just jump onto the Discord server. I'm always there to help out and to get you up and over that hurdle of learning about module federation and Mike always glad to help. Web performance. So there is no easier way to make more money on the web than just make your pages quicker. So it's a great skill to have, and it's a deep skill. At the very least, if you're in the React land, I would learn about how to use React Lazy and Lazy Loading right now. That's probably the easiest performance benefit you're gonna be able to make. Just don't put as big of an initial payload on the page and only bring in the code that you need when you actually need it. But there's a lot more to learn than that, and I'm sure I'll be making some videos in the year to come. WebAssembly. This is kind of an interesting one because it, I don't think it actually applies to every engineer, but it is something worth paying attention to. I think it's most of, of a fit in the enterprise space, which I mean like B2B, like accounting apps and HR apps and you know, kind of backend stuff, maybe the back end of your CMS system. Anything where people might be using like ASP.NET or the Microsoft tooling, which brings up Microsoft's Blazor, which is the reason why I think we should really take WebAssembly seriously in 2021 and into 2022. Blazor is kind of like a view, 
type system, but it compiles to assembly and then it's got all the shim layer in there to connect it to the DOM and do all the DOM manipulation for you. So it's a really easy way to do that. There's also assembly script, which is a compiler for TypeScript that then creates WebAssembly code. If someone were to fuse that with a DOM manipulation system, that would create a really compelling open source alternative to Blazor. And I expect that that will happen probably in the 21, 2021, 2022 timeframe. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, if it does, I'll cover it on this channel. Unified tooling. So Rome is a project from Facebook. And the idea is to have one single project that encapsulates linting and testing and compiling and packing and all of the stuff that you, the basics that you need in a JavaScript ecosystem. And the reason for that is pretty simple. All of these tools, ESLint, Prettier, Jest, Webpack, have kind of grown up organically over time and they don't always mesh all that well together. In particular, like ESLint and Prettier kind of fight like nobody's business. So <laughs> Rome is a nice package that kind of unifies all that. Deno is another example of a package that's kind of con congealing all that together in one spot. You can now actually compile Deno applications into native executables, really cool stuff. So that's something to keep an eye out for in 2021 and maybe just try out Rome or Deno and see how you like it. Monorepos, why would you want to invest that over the next year? Well. It's important to a lot of companies because it's the way that you can scale a system of interrelated applications and modules and keep your versioning headaches to, well, at least a manageable state. And the reason it's important now is because it's not just in Yarn anymore, it's now in NPM 7 as part of the release package. And so workspaces, which is how you implement the, the essentially the core functionality of monorepos is now baked into both NPM and Yarn. I would spend some time getting familiar with that, at least at the workspaces level. And if you want to push on from there and get it all the way through a CI CD flow, you might want to look into learning Lerna as well. There's a link in this, the description to that and uh, to get you started. A bonus one for you, static. I covered this in the 2020 Tech Trends video. It's still just as important in 2021 with the release of Next.js 9.3 earlier in the year. The Next.js platform now supports static site generation in addition to server-side rendering and client-side rendering. There's a great video on this channel that walks you through all that and you should just to understand the benefits of static site generation, how and why it may be preferable to, for example, server-side rendering or client-side rendering, not having to watch a server, a big, really important one there. <laughs> At least certainly it's my reason for being interested in it. You definitely should check out Static in 2021. All right, all of these things are going to be subjects of the 2021 year of Blue Collar Coder videos. I'm really happy that you are watching these videos and I'm glad that you're getting stuff out of them. If you have any questions or comments about this particular video, be sure to put those in the comment section down below. There is a link to our Discord server in the description as well as our newsletter that you can click on and get access to these videos a day earlier than everybody else. But of course, in the meantime, from me to you, be happy, be healthy and safe in 2021 and fingers crossed, it's a appreciably better year than 2020. Oh, hey, one more thing though, uh, tiny little thing, dark mode. I actually think this is gonna be a big deal in 2021. All of the sites are gonna wanna support it in some way or another. Be sure that you're up to date on uh, your framework and make sure that that can support dark mode if the customer chooses that. Also, I wouldn't be really surprised if we get a style refresh in 2021. The material flat look is really old now, and we might be going back to gradient fills again, just kind of bobbing between those two things. Or there might be a push if Apple does this towards glass morphism or new morphism. So definitely things to keep an eye out. And of course, if any of that happens, you'll find it here on Blue Collar Coder.